Hello everybody and welcome or welcome back to The Second Shelf and to another Tops and Flops video, my Tops and Flops of the month of August. If you follow me, you know um, the drill. Every month I look back at my reading and I pick um, a couple of books that I thought were tops and one or two that I thought mm, not so much flops. Um, in August, um, I did finish 30 books in 30 days, by the way, in case you are interested, it's the 31st today. Um, but I still want to do the tops and flops as I always do them. So, you know, three in the tops, two in, in the flops, even though I have to say of the 30 books I read, there were a lot of really good books in Goodreads terms, four star reads, you know, uh, but still, we just keep with the format. <laughs> anyway, so we all, as always, yeah, we keep with the format if I can get the words out of my mouth right. So as always, we start with the tops, and within the tops, uh, we start with the book that surprised me the most, and that was a poetry collection uh, by Mary Olive, Oliver, sorry, uh, Why I Wake Early. And this book was published in 2004. Um, I never read Mary Oliver. As you know, if you follow my channel, I'm not that huge on poetry, but I said um, on uh, on uh, Sunday that the 30 books in 30 days, I did read um, three or four poetry collections, which is huge amount for me in a month. Um, and Mary Oliver was also the uh, pick for the book Naturalist Book Club, you know, the book club run by uh, Heidi from My Reading Life and Doris from All the Books, in which they encourage us to read nature writing and they pick a book each month for the whole year already. Um, and a couple of times they do author spotlight. So they don't pick one particular book, but they just want to spotlight the author. And August was, was author spotlight for spotlight for Mary Oliver. Uh, she also re uh, wrote essays, but because she is known as a poet, um, and because I'm, you know, not reading that many uh, poems, I thought I'd pick a poetry collection. And I struggle often with poetry because it just goes right over my head, especially if it's not in German. This is obviously in English. Um, and it's like I read it um, and then it doesn't really mean anything to me. I know that is also because I don't read that much poetry. If you read more, you get more, um, you know, uh, you, accustomed. Um, maybe that is the right word to how poetry works. And I read a lot of poetry when I was young, of course, you know, teenager. They all read poetry and then they cry. But like I said, that was in German, in the German language. So that's different for me. So it's always a surprise to me. That's why this book is in the category, um, a book that surprised me the most. If I read poetry and I think, hey, this means something to me. And it really speaks to me also emotionally. And she has, she talks about nature mainly in her poetry, about certain animals, but also about, you know, the morning sunrise or the snow. Um, and I just loved her imagery. Her imagery was for me beautiful uh, in a way that I could understand it. She has these, like the, it was in the first or the second poem that I thought, I understand that. Uh, and she talks about looking, not just standing around, but uh, standing around with your arms open. That's how she would call what, what she means by looking. Yeah, I, I, I can understand that. So I really enjoyed uh, her poetry. Uh, I will uh, certainly read more. Uh, I already looked um, at the body of her work. Uh, so I will pick um, a couple more poetry collections. But if you are into nature, um, and oh yeah, the second surprise was also, I knew from when I googled her that she uh, is quite a religious, a devout person, at least that's what I gathered. And that is also something because I'm not. And if a poet, uh, if poetry is really all the time telling me how wonderful God is, 
that just doesn't speak to me. She doesn't. She talks about nature, and I'm sure in her own mind it is the beauty of nature is, you know, a sign of God, but she doesn't hit me over the head with it. So I appreciated that just in case uh, you were wondering about the religious aspect. So that was the book that surprised me the most. Um, then the book I thought about the most, uh, I that was actually a difficult pick because there were quite some books that uh, made me think Um and then I decided to go for a reread, and I didn't even check because it might very well be that this book had already been in the tops and flops uh, when I first read it a couple of years ago, and that was the short novella by Becky Chambers, uh, To Be Taught a Fortunate, uh, published in 2021. Um, this is not part of, a, of her series, the Wayfarer series, um, even though you can, I bought the box set of the Wayfarer series, and this is the fourth book, which doesn't really make sense because there is a fourth part. But we will not talk about that because that's irksome. I didn't really mind because I wanted to have this book anyway. Um, so this is a standalone novella, and the premise um, is that um, it is set on a spaceship um, exploring worlds beyond. Um, the earth where you would uh, expect life and they encounter they have four or five planets where they have to go to have to go to um, and the various life forms they encounter and it's just so incredibly well done in the sense that the stories are good but of course there is also a message if you want to delve a little deeper of what we how we classify life, uh, what we uh, classify as, you know, high life, evolved, um, how completely helpless we are in a way if we encounter life forms that are utterly different from what we know uh, and how we try still try to put them in this mold um, that we are familiar with. So, this whole idea of encountering something that is alien to you, quote unquote alien, whether it's an alien being or whether it's just something, um, you know, if you take it as a metaphor that you are not familiar with, a different culture, people who look differently, uh, who live differently. Yeah, I thought it was a real delight to read it, but it's also made me think. And if you're wondering why there is a rubber band around the book, I just realized that I didn't take it away before filming. Mm. One of my pet peeves. Okay, so I'll, I'll put the book. Uh, when the, This is one of the, I will, I will put a picture up here. This is one of the books. I have a, a, a shelf. Um, just wait for the picture. Um, <laughs> explain first. I have a shelf um, where I have my sci-fi and on top of the shelf I have a couple of books, series mainly or by the same author stacked like this. So not on the shelf but stacked like this. And this is the top book, now picture, uh, of the stack with Becky Chambers. And I just can't deal if the top book flaps open. I just can't. Can't deal. No, 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 no. Makes me really really ugh, you know like uh, so there is a, a rubber band around the book yeah that's just me anyway moving on best non-fiction yes the camera angle changed a little bit because i had to get up and answer the door <laughs> um, anyway, best nonfiction. That's what I was. Yeah, I did not read that much nonfiction. I mean, you would expect if you read 30 books, and normally I read about a third of my reading is nonfiction at least. So you would expect at least 10 books. Um, but I read a lot of, I had a lot of rereads with nonfiction. And even though the book with the rubber band was also a reread. I didn't want to include only rereads um, in uh, the tops and flops. So I chose a book that was maybe not, you know, the the absolute best nonfiction in like it was written, but 
uh, yeah, let, let me first tell you which book it is. Um, uh, again, I read it on script, so I'll put a picture up here, Nellie Bly, uh, Ten Days in a Madhouse, first published in 1887. I came across Nellie Bly, whom I had never heard of. She traveled the world uh, in 100 days or something, all by herself, I learned. But I came across her in this book that I read together with Heidi last year, The Women I Think About at Night, by Finnish author Mia Kankimäki, translated from the Finnish by Douglas Robinson. And here the, the, the author follows some of her heroes who are traveling women because she's also, she loves to travel and she is a travel writer. Um, and one of the women she mentions is Nellie Bly because of her um, traveling around the world thing. But she was uh, a journalist uh, first and foremost. And this book, uh, 10 Days in a Madhouse, uh, she had herself committed into um uh, um, uh, an asylum, as they said back then, um, for the insane. Uh, and she spent 10 days there and then uh, she was uh, released by her publisher. Um, uh, and th this is an account of the 10 days. And I thought the book, first of all, made me cringe about how people with mental illness were treated. And I fear that they are still treated badly, not not everywhere, um, and m maybe not in this particular institution if it's still uh, around, but in general, you, you hear stories st still, um, you know, even though it's more than 100 years later. Um, but also how all the inmates, quote-unquote, were women, and how easy it was for her uh, to be uh, committed to um, uh, an asylum just by acting a little bit strange without hurting anybody and having no family, being poor, being a woman, um, pretending to be from a, you know, a, a no income. Um, and the women she encounters in the asylum, some of them are clearly not mentally ill, but they have been committed by family, by husbands. So, yeah. It's a book that is important and it also shows how important investigative journal journalism is, always has been, and especially the courageous type. Like, I mean, she didn't know, first of all, whether she would for sure be able to get out. One flew over the cuckoo's nest, you know, um, and the treatment was horrible. So, yeah. I encourage you to read it um, because it's an important book. Not a nice book, but an important book. Nellie Bly. Yes. Ten Days in the Madhouse. These were the tops. And now you're all waiting for, as always, for the flops. And I have two, as I regularly do. And the first one... I put in the flops with a little bit of pain in my heart because the author didn't deserve to go in the flops. But the, the book angered me so much, how the book was put uh, together. And that was another buddy read with Heidi. And we read uh, Lu Luisa Capetillo, A Nation of Women, uh, translated, uh, sorry, forgot the translator, translated from the Spanish, She's from. she was from Puerto Rico, by Alan West du Duran. Um, and first published uh, in 1911, I think. Uh, yes, and this edition in 2021. So Luisa Capitillo, Puerto Rican, um, an activist, uh, especially for workers' rights, um, and she was kind of forgotten, especially there was no English translation. So this was put together in 2021 with a lengthy introduction uh, by a Puerto Rican scholar, um, Felix Matos Rodriguez. It's like 50 pages, and first of all, it's boring. Second of all, it doesn't really say anything about the book. Um, it gives some biographical information, so that's good. And then we come to the essays. There is no context provided whatsoever. If you watch my video, uh, the Sunday video, when I talked about the Sappho poems, 
um, where you had a poem on one side and on the opposite side, there was a context and explanation, what she's talking about, references. I mean, you don't have to do that for every single essay in that form. But I mean, at least when you talk about something, you could tell me the year it was published or written. Um, then there were pieces in there that I read that were obviously by somebody written by somebody else. Why? Why are they included? Is that a friend of hers? Is that a reaction to something Capetillo wrote? Um, and then at the end, we ha have uh, letters to people or reactions to people. Um, and you see the little star uh, over the name and you think, oh, it will tell you who that is. No, it doesn't. Um, it, so I don't know who that person is and why uh, Capetillo would react to that person. And then you had um, postcards included. Um, let me see. Yes, the, the last part is postcards that she had written, again, to people whom she knew. Why? How did she know them? I have no idea. So this book, Penguin, made it into the flocks, and it's bloody hell a Penguin Classics, because I think it's a disgrace. It's really a disgrace how bad this book was put together and what a disservice it is to this woman who had been forgotten and now she has been treated in that way. When we talk about the essays, uh, Heidi talked about it in her uh, uh, video. She, she already reviewed this. There were a lot of things about Capetillo that I did not quite understand. Her spiritualism, she was a spiritist. Um, but also some of her, she was hailed as a feminist, but she had partly very, for me, traditional ideas about motherhood being the goal for women. But again, there was no context provided. Um, so, yeah, the cover was beautiful and well chosen. And the rest, Penguin Classics, was a disgrace. Yeah, take that. Anyway. The second flop was fiction, and I think I'm a, a total minority here because this book has been hailed by everybody and their mother as one of the winners, should be winners of the Booker Prize. It is long listed, and I just thought it was not good. So, Claire Keegan, small things like these, published 2021. Claire Keegan uh, is a British author. I have never read her. Um, uh, and the story is based around um, um, an actual event or events or occurrence or however you want to call it, and that's the Magdalene laundries that were put up in Ireland by the Catholic Church in convents, and women were just slave workers. They are mainly women who were pregnant um, without being married. Uh, there was no way for them to leave. So horrible. And that went on for a long, long time. So this given is um, the center, in a way, the center of the story, because you have one of those Magdalene laundries in this book. It's set in 1985 in Ireland just the week before Christmas. So it's also kind of a Christmas carol song, uh, a song, yeah, Christmas carol uh, uh, novella. Uh, the main character whom we follow uh, is Bill. He is a timber um, uh, merchant, has his own factory, comes from a poor background, is also an, uh, a child with a single mother, doesn't know who his father is. He was born just after the war, 1946, and worked his way up uh, to owning um, this, um, this factory. Um, he's happily married, even though the wife is doesn't want to touch the heavy stuff. Um, at least that's how she is portrayed. You know, she's just content with having her tea and having a nice home and 
you know. Um, and he is looking for something. And then he encounters, while he's delivering timber, uh, the hardships, especially one particular girl, uh, maybe 16 years old, in that uh, um, San Magdalene laundry, and then what he does with it. Uh, also, the thing with his father is revealed. Yeah, I thought the language was beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> so the, the the reading experience was a delight, was really, really fantastic. The story, not so much. I thought it was really sentimental. Um, the solution for the father, Bill's father, I thought, no, no, don't go there. Don't go there, please. And then she went there. Um, also, this whole male savior thing is just something that I'm yeah, not interested, you know. Uh, but the sentimentality of it all, it was for me, it was really um, sweet in all the wrong way. So I, I just didn't get along with it, except for the language. Anyway, so these were my tops and flops for the 30 in 30 uh, in uh, of August. I'm very happy that I did the challenge and that I actually read the 30 books, pleased with myself. And it, was, it wasn't a chore. It was real fun to do. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. As always, looking forward to your comments. And I'll see you all soon in the next one.